he's happy to have questions during, um, and he'll speak about, he'll prepare us about all he wants to know about locality, non sorry, non-locality, contextuality, and measurement-based quantum computing. Great, so good morning everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be, to be kicking off this, this meeting, and um, I'm pleased that many of you come along to this first session. Um, as Chris said, my two lectures today and tomorrow are going to be uh, about some, some recent, and in some cases not so recent, connections that have been made between non-locality, non contextuality, and quantum computing. Um, what I'm going to tell you about really splits, splits neatly in two. And so today I'm going to be talking about uh, classic non-locality type experiments like the CHSH experiment and how we can make connections between that and measurement-based quantum computing, the, the cluster state model of quantum computing that some of you will be familiar with. Those of you who are not familiar with it, I'm going to also introduce that during my lecture. Um, and in tomorrow's lecture, I'm going to focus more on a particular model of quantum computing which is important in fault-tolerant quantum computing. This is called the so-called magic state model of fault-tolerant quantum computing. And recently, uh, again not so recently, some nice connections have been made between this model and contextuality. Uh, and so my, my goal for tomorrow's lecture will be to sort of introduce the, the basics of that model of computation and of the, the way we, we might uh, wish to describe and, and demonstrate contextuality and show how those jigsaw pieces have been put together. Um, I've actually um, put up a small web page, so here's the URL with just my notes. So, actually, it's right here. Bit.do, bit.do, um, qpl underscore dan, and I just put up there, for those of you interested in my notes, and also some, some references, um, and there'll be notes there for today and tomorrow. Okay, great, so let's, let's kick off with something that everyone's familiar with, the CHSH inequality. And I guess this and the, the bell inequality is really where a lot of these ideas started. In particular, the idea of comparing quantum mechanics to uh, hidden variable models, putting certain restrictions on those hidden variable models, and then seeing what the differences are in the predictions of those, those theories. And in particular, we have a nice two-person experiment. Alice and Bob have long separated labs. Each measures one of two observables. Let's call them A1 and A2. Bob, B1 and B2. Okay, it's all nice and familiar. The outcomes of these measurements are plus and minus one, so you can think of them as uh, Pauli matrices, if you like, Pauli observables that they're measuring. And what we know is that in any local hidden variable model, um, the expectation value of the product of these four possible measurements they can make, the four possible combinations of these two measurements, this has to satisfy a certain classic inequality, the CHSH inequality. Let's quickly write it down. Okay, so this should be familiar to, to everyone, and it should uh, be equally familiar to everyone that quantum mechanics violates this. So if Alice and Bob have in their possession a maximally entangled state and they set their measurements to certain observables, they can violate this up to 2 root 2. So, okay, 
Okay, so this is a nice example of what's called Bell's theorem, the incompatibility of quantum mechanics in a local hidden variable model. And you see it's sort of a very simple experiment. Now, what has this simplest of non-locality experiments got to do with computation? What's, what could it possibly have to do with, with any sort of comp computation, let alone classical computation? Well, I guess the nice sort of step in this, in this direction came very naturally um, when computer scientists started to think about quantum mechanics and started to think about these things. Uh, really motivated by the, the birth of quantum information. And of course, computer scientists would have looked at this and have been horrified by the mess, the, the, the awful notation, and the inconsistency in which, with which things are laid. So you see, we're labeling our measurement settings by integers 1 and 2. Our outcomes are labeled by plus and minus 1. It's all a big mess. Um, it's clear that. There are two choices here, two choices here, and two choices here. So the natural thing to do is, is relabel re everything with bits. Okay. So let's relabel everything with bits and see what happens. And so now um, Alice and Bob okay, are going to have measurements. Labeled by bits A and B. And the outcomes are going to be labeled X and Y, and they're also bits. Okay? And then it's just a matter of some simple algebra, and you see that the, the expectation value that we're studying here is the product of these outcomes, product of plus and minus one. So when we map that to bits, product here <coughs> becomes the sum modulo two of bits over here. And with, with, with this translation, the CHSH experiment becomes what we can think of as a, as a gambling game. Okay, we can describe it as a, as a game <coughs> whose aim is the following. So, given bits A and B, Alice and Bob want to return Two bits x and y such that the sum modulo 2 of these bits is equal to the product of the given bits. And you can translate the CHH, CSH inequality into a bound on the success probability for this game. And under the assumption that A and B are uniform, so A and B are really given uniformly at random, then we find that the CHSH inequality tells us that in a local head variable model, the probability of succeeding here is less than or equal to three quarters, and in QM, it gets a bit higher, it gets to something approximately equal to 85%. So we know it's exactly it's a half plus root 2 over 4. Okay, so this is nothing more than a restatement of the CHH essential inequality. But it is already bring, bringing with it a a new interpretation. Alice and Bob are trying to use their correlations to multiply two bits. See, that's their aim. They're, they're, they're returning bits x and y such that their parity is the product of a and b. So, 
it seems, at least, at least superficially, there's a link between um, CHSH type experiment and computation. So, so, now, this is an example of something called an XOR game. Um, and that's because we're looking at the, the XOR of the <coughs> measurement outcomes returned by Alice and Paul. And we can make an association between, very simple association between uh, the arithmetic here and basic Boolean logic gates. So addition modulo 2, of course, is representing XOR. Multiplication is nothing other than the, the AND gate. So we can, we can think of this as somehow trying to use correlations to convert an XOR gate into an AND gate. So let's see another example of that. We may not be convinced by this yet, so I'll try and convince you further with another example. Looking for the eraser. It's on the board. Clappable. Nice <coughs> eraser. three-particle experiment, three-party experiment, um, as a way to demonstrate the same sort of incompatibility between quantum mechanics and a local hidden variable model, but without the, the pesky inequalities. So it's sort of a, a straight contradiction between the predictions of the local hidden variable model and quantum mechanics. And so now we have Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And they share the GHZ state. Zero, 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 plus one, one, one. And similarly to before, they're going to make certain local measurements in their labs based upon some um, instruction that comes to them from outside. They're then going to return a measurement outcome, and, and we're going to look at the statistics of those outcomes. Now, the GHZ state has certain very clear, clear symmetries, um, and one of them is that it's an eigenstate of the tensor product of x, x, and x. In fact, it's an eigenstate with plus one eigenvalue, very simply, this term is flipped into this term and vice versa. We also notice that it's an eigenstate of x, y, y. Perhaps not so immediately obvious, but you can convince yourselves. Um, so, y um, is going to flip these um, zeros to ones, and it also introduces a, a phase at the same time. And if you put that in, you'll find that the two terms get flipped, and a minus sign is introduced. And through the, the symmetry of this, we can also write down two equations which are just permutations of these operators. Y, X, X, and X, X, Y. Okay, and they all fulfill the same equation. Why two X's? Pardon? There's a question? Why two X's and one Y? Ah, Y two X's and one Y, so it should be two Y's. 
So my i's and x's and y's are the same. So x, x. Okay. Yes. So in each case, we've got two, two y's and one x. And in each case, this is x minus, minus one eigenvalue. And what that means is if Alice and Bob make these measurements, if, if, if they make these measurements x and y, according to one of these four combinations, the product of the outcomes of these measurements must be plus one or minus one. So this is compatible <coughs> with a very simple hidden variable model where you associate the value plus and minus one with the variable x and y. And if you multiply these things together, you'll see that if we assume that these three lines are true, this, this would imply that the uh, the product of x, x, and x would have to be minus 1. Okay. Just convince yourself that by just assigning plus and minus 1 values to each of these variables and then multiplying them together. So this is a straight contradiction between the predictions of quantum mechanics and the predictions of this hidden variable model. And what I want to do now is take this GZ experiment and do the same rewriting. We write it in terms of bits we saw before, and, and see if we can interpret, interpret this in a similar, as a similar sort of computational game. So, it's the same, same translation as before. So let's assign the following. So, let's say... Um, so we're going to have these input bits, which are, well, I'll call them setting bits. These are going to tell them which measurement setting to choose. Um, and I'll call those A, B, and C. And zero is going to correspond to measuring Y. One is going to correspond to measuring X. And the outcomes as before, I'm going to label this x, y, and z. So now let's just translate this um, set of eigenvalue equations into a just a table of input and output for this for this model, like a like a truth table. So let me write down the possibilities. So we had y, y, x. Y, X, Y, X, Y, X, and X, X, X. Okay, so, so A, B, and C, oops, space, A, B, and C, corresponding to these four sets of measurements, we can, we can just write it. So we've got uh, 0, 0, 1, um, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1. So you see we've, we've not, we're not considering all possible eight combinations of measurements that Alice and Bob could, could make with these observables. In the second line from yes. the bottom, shouldn't it be like x, y, y? Yes, sorry. <coughs> Thank you. Sorry, I have a, a blindness for x and y. <laughs> they always look the same. Zero and one's a bunch, but this is another reason. For <laughs> no. look, at, look at that and look at that. Why, would you, why do we use x and y? Um, so you might notice a pattern that c is always equal to a plus B plus 1. Okay. So, C is related to A and B, but it's related <laughs> via XOR okay. So now let's put another line with the outcome of this experiment. And these products of eigenvalues of, of X and Y in bit language, they're just translated <coughs> to a sum. So X plus Y plus Z. Okay, and we see we'll get uh, 1, 1, 1, 0. Okay. 
And this is nothing other than a times b plus 1. So the GHZ game, the GHZ experiment, can also be interpreted as a computational game. It's a little bit more complicated than before because we have this extra party C and we have this extra condition on C. Um, but the basic structure is the same. Okay. We can think of this as Alice, Bob and Charlie allowing themselves XOR gates. Okay. And you see that the, the, the bit C here, which sets Charlie's measurement, can be described as an XOR of A and B plus 1. The plus 1s are only there, by the way, because I wanted to use the traditional form of the GXZ state and write down the familiar eigenvalue equations. You could modify this nicely to an equivalent um, experiment where all these plus 1s went away. And then we, we see that the outcome of this is that the, the parity of the outputs is encoding, um, in this case, the NAND of the inputs. So we can describe the game as a very similar. The aim of Alice, Bob, and Charlie is to produce bits such that their parity is the product of some input bit. plus an extra bit flip, which we don't care about. And, you know, the, the success probability with quantum mechanics... Excuse me. Even if we know this is, is correct, that the parity of the output is AB plus 1, it would also be correct, and I think more illuminating, by right, ABC plus 1. Yeah. There's a person in the second one. There's a NAND of all inputs, that doesn't work. Yes? Absolutely. So, so, quantum mechanics, we can win this game with probability 1. And what's the best success probability we could, we could achieve this with a uh, local hidden variable model? Well, surprise, surprise, it's three quarters. So, it's the same. So, why is it the same? Well, we can analyze these two experiments in a very similar way and come to very similar conclusions. And you know, if, we, if we strip down this experiment to its sort of, to its bare bones and think about what the local hidden variable model could achieve computationally, we see very simply that that model is extremely limited, it's extremely trivial. I mean, what we're trying to do here is get a computation out of correlations. And this is not something that correlations normally do. It's certainly not something that we expect correlations to, to, to give us in a local hidden variable model or in some sort of classical probability theory. And yet, it appears that correlations are doing computation for us when we use quantum measurements on entangled quantum states. So, So I would like to, 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 to introduce now just a very simple framework for understanding this and understanding why we get this three quarters probability in this experiment. And you know, you could generalize this to all sorts of different settings with all sorts of different numbers of parties, and you'll always get the local hidden variable success probability of three quarters. This is all 
super simple and nice and nice and simple for the first Monday morning of the of the of the workshop. So it really boils down to linear versus non-linear. And so what's a Boolean function is just a map from n bits to 1 bit. You may be aware that any Boolean function you can write down as a polynomial over Z2, so a polynomial with multiplication and addition modulo 2. So you can express any Boolean function f of x as some polynomial. So Okay, so eg f of x, I'll say f of a, b, c equals a plus b, c plus x. Okay, this is an example of a polynomial. It's a degree three polynomial because the highest term we have three terms multiplied. So we can write our Boolean functions as polynomials and we can compute their degree. So the linear Boolean functions are nothing other than the degree 1 functions. In other words, they're the functions which contain no multiplication, just addition. So, and again, very basic, basic stuff from <coughs> sort of reminder of, of, of being back at school. We can describe any Boolean function with a universal set of operations, XOR and AND. This is obvious from the fact we can write it as a polynomial, because a polynomial is already a decomposition of a function into XOR and AND. So, these linear Boolean functions correspond to the functions which can be expressed using XOR alone. You also want that quantum, I suppose. And yes, let's assume we can we can have constants. Um, yeah. So, so now we see something very, very simple. Imagine you have a computer which only contains XOR gates. You know, and you could build one, you could build such a computer. This computer would only be able to compute linear Boolean functions and nothing more. If your computer now has an AND gate, all of a sudden it can do everything. So we can see the this, this space of functions is split in two by the number of gates we have access to. We'll see a strong, very close analogy of this in quantum computing tomorrow when we talk about magic state distillation. But this is a very simple idea. Okay? If we construct Boolean functions out of XOR gates, they have to be linear. If we allow us to use, if we allow and gates, then they can become non-linear. So, our computational expressiveness depends on the, the, the gate set at, at our disposal. So now we can, we can analyze these experiments from this point of view, just asking, you know, in the, hidden, in the local hidden variable model, is there anything, under the assumptions we make about the experiment, is there anything in the experiment which would allow us to compute an AND gate? Is there anything in the experiment that allows us to compute XOR gates? And if we find we can compute XOR gates, but not ANDs, then we're restricted to computing linear functions. So that's the, the, the basic idea. Um, And the GXZ makes makes quite a nice example. So we can imagine 
bit values A and B coming in from outside, and entering Alice and Bob's lab, while there's some A plus B plus 1 goes into Charlie's lab. Okay. They then make their measurements. They um, send forward their, out their outputs, x, y, and z. And then the final outcome of this is the parity of those three things. So in the local hidden variable model, there's no connection between what's going on here and here, or here and here. And we can actually write down an exhaustive set of possible maps between the input and output of Alice, Bob, and Charlie's boxes. Okay. And what are those possibilities? Well, there are only four of them. And they correspond to the four single-bit Boolean functions. So the relationship between here and here can be either a constant function, always outputting 0 and 1. It could be the identity function. The output is always equal to the input. Or it could be the not. Now, all of those functions are linear. Um, and if, if, if Alice, Bob, and Charlie have shared randomness, that doesn't help, because that just allows them to, to achieve a convex combination of linear functions. Okay, they now have randomness, they can, do, um, they can use this randomness to condition um, what they choose to do to their bit, but it will still remain linear. The extra post-processing in this experiment at the beginning, we have linear pre-processing here, but again, it's all XORs. And at the output, we have X plus Y plus Z. It's all XORs. So in this experiment, the CHSH experiment, and any, many multi-party generalizations of the CHSH experiment, the, the Bell and Equality bound can be reduced to this simple fact. This computer can only compute linear functions. And so where does the three quarters come from? So it's 75%. Well, this just, just corresponds to the, the overlap between AND and the closest linear function. Okay, let me write down the truth table. So it's 0, 0, 0, 1. Well, what would be the closest um, linear function is an easy one, just the constant function 0. And you can see it shares 3 quarters of the elements in the output column. And I think you can easily convince yourself that that's an upper bound. Okay, we don't need to go any further with that. And so that's where this 75% can be derived. We can derive it by just asserting that this, in this computational view of this experiment, there is no, there is no component which can allow us to compute any nonlinear gate, any multiplication between bits, and therefore the output has to be a linear function of the input, or a, or a convex combination of such functions. So this gives us a a hint that there is a way of thinking about quantum correlations which is computational in flavor. There's something that the, the quantum computation is, is bringing to the picture which we can interpret in this language as an extra computational ability, the ability to multiply numbers, the ability to compute aggregates. Now, quantum mechanics can achieve this perfectly in the GHZ experiment, when we have three parties and one party has um, inputs dependent upon the inputs of the other party. We saw that we couldn't achieve this perfectly in um, the, the two-player experiment. So in, we just have Alice and Bob, the upper bound to the success probability was 85%. So you might consider, well, what would happen if Alice and Bob won this game 100% of the time? 
and then indeed you can write down uh, correlations that will, will do that. And you've just written down the pesca rulic non-local box. So the extra non-locality that you, you get from considering a, a, uh, a maximally CHSH violating no signaling theory, you can associate it with the ability for correlations to perform an AND gate without acids. So maybe that's not the most, the most exciting and compelling way of, of thinking about uh, PR boxes, but it's a very nice sort of simplification and it's, it also shows us that the, the quantum mechanics and, and PR boxes are not that far away from each other. The only difference is <coughs> quantum mechanics needs a little helping hand to achieve the same computational task. Okay, so I'm about halfway through my lecture and I'm going to switch, switch topics um, at this stage. So I've hopefully convinced you that CHSH and GHZ can be interpreted in a computational way. The, the correlations can be used for computation. It was a very, perhaps a simplistic and maybe contrived setting, but hopefully I've convinced you that we can, we can think about these correlations like that. So now I'm going to switch to something less contrived and more complete. In fact, I'm going to show you how to achieve universal quantum computing in a very similar setting, um, with single side measurements, single qubit measurements, on an entangled state. And this is measurement based quantum computing. <coughs> so, when we first learn about quantum computing, we normally learn about the circuit model. The circuit model is a very natural way to describe a quantum computer. You imagine you have um, a set of qubits. We have n qubits prepared in some initial state, maybe the zero state. And then we allow then we perform a sequence of unitary gates on these qubits. And then at the end of the computation, we measure the qubits. Okay. And if we work with a universal gate set, An example of a universal gate set is C0 gate, which flips the second bit from 0 to 1 if, the first, if and only if the first bit is in state 1. We, we combine the C0 gate with any single qubit rotation, and so because of the, the block sphere picture of qubits, we can think of um, we have a nice geometric picture of the unitaries of single qubits. So any single qubit rotation plus C0, that gives us a universal gate set. So from in this circuit model, by building up circuits of C0 and rotations, we can perform any quantum computation. So this is a very <coughs> compelling computational picture because it also as well as giving you the, the means to say, write down algorithms and analyze their properties, it's also a recipe for building a quantum computer. It tells you you need to take a set of isolated systems with well-defined qubits in them. You need to find ways of manipulating those qubits and interacting with one another to achieve this universal gate set. And then you also need to measure these qubits. So, Experimental realizations of quantum computing have to overcome all of these, these separate building blocks. And David DiVincenzo famously wrote down a set of criterion in which he sort of elucidated this idea and gave some very clear necessary features that a circuit model on the computer would have to satisfy. So, 
So measurement-based quantum computing or cluster state quantum computing or one-way quantum computing, it has many names, is an alternative and computationally equivalent model. And it gives us both a different way to write down computations, a different way to understand quantum computations, and also a different recipe for implementing them. And the way it works, call it MBQC for short, it's just two steps. So in step one, we create an entangled resource state, such as a cluster state. Okay. We do this on poly n qubits. So n, just to compare, n is the number of qubits we had in the circuit model. We need more qubits now, but only polynomially more. And then step two is we measure the single qubits. Adaptively, and by adaptively I mean the, the, the choice of the measurement basis um, is to a certain extent determined by the outcome of previous measurements. And the sort of measurements I'm considering are measurements of arbitrary poorly observable. So you can think of this as corresponding to any axis on the block sphere, any set of orthogonal cubic projectors. These are the, 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 the range of measurements we're going to allow ourselves. And that versatility, that range of measurements, allows us to <coughs> have the same expressiveness that we would have by writing down a circuit of CNOT gates and rotations. We can achieve the same expressiveness with a set of single qubit measurements. So the, the, the single qubit measurements now define the computation. Dan, can I ask a question? Yes. You said you have adaptivity in your choice of measurement basis. Do you also have adaptivity in your choice of which qubits to measure? You don't need that. Okay. Um, there, so there are, there are more than one, as you say, there's more than one um, model of quantum computer, measurement based quantum computation. They have slightly different properties. I'm, today I'm just going to talk about one of them, which is based on cluster states. Cluster states does not need that, but other variants of measurement based quantum computing do. So let me tell you what a cluster state or graph state is. And these are beautifully simple definition. They're defined by a graph, G. So it's a very simple, undirected graph, no self loops like this one. Okay. And so <coughs> every vertex is associated with a qubit. And we prepare those qubits in the state plus, where plus is just 0 plus 1 over root 2. So all qubits prepared in the same state. And so, so far, this is a very simple state with no entanglement. So the edges introduce the entanglement. Wherever there's an edge between two qubits, we apply a controlled Z gate. So, so each of these edges is a control Z gate. Just to remind you what a control Z gate is, so we write it like this. And it's nothing other than a controlled knot with some Hadamard gates around. So you can think of it as a controlled our Z operator conditional on the state of one of the first qubit, we apply a, a Z Pauli operator to the second. And this is, if you write down a matrix representation of this, you'll see straight away that it's symmetric between the two, hence this nice notation. Is, is there any particular reason why we choose uh, the vertices to represent the state plus? This is just convention. Just so, 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 I mean, the, there is a relationship between the state plus and the CZ, and you could do all sorts of local transformations of that. But um, so you could have, you could actually build this from any equal superposition state. 
Um, and then the, the CZ gate is unique because it's the only maximally entangling diagonal gate. But um, there is a certain, you could, you could change this from plus to any other basis and it would be any other um, equal superposition. And if I roll Z commutes, so that it doesn't matter in which order you do that. Exactly. And the control Z, the other important property of control Z <coughs> is that CZ gates commute with one another. So there is no need to label the edges, there's no ordering in which these CZs are applied. So in some sense you can think of this as the simplest recipe, almost the simplest recipe for writing down families of multi-cubit multi entangled states that you could, you could come up with. So cluster states are simply graph states on a grid-like graph. The, um, the distinction is sort of historical. These were the, the first to be studied, so the graph G is a grid. So, the cluster states, you can see that they, they in some sense, they're quite similar to Bell states and, and GHZ states. They have that similar property of maximal entanglement. And, as I'll talk some more tomorrow, that actually, all of these states, the, the Bell state, the cluster state, the GHZ, are part of a larger family of GHZ, sorry, of stabilized states, which share a lot of <coughs> properties. And, in some sense, these, these states have enough entanglement in them that you can now achieve universal quantum computation by just single qubit measurements. So each measurement you do is going to reduce the entanglement in this state in a certain sense. And so with that notion of entanglement, you see that these states have to have within them more entanglement than the equivalent, or at least as much entanglement as the equivalent um, quantum circuit could create. So, each, once you've built your square cluster state, each of these qubits is going to be measured in one of two types of bases, either the Z bases or basis which is on the equator of the block sphere. So we could write it cos theta x plus sine theta y. So some um, equatorial measurement on, on the block sphere. Okay. And so by assigning, so where, where theta is a, is a parameter that we can, we can vary. And so our description of our, of our algorithm now is now a set of measurements for each of these, these qubits. And the qubits are in fact adaptive in the sense that these measurements, these equatorial measurements, would be better written cos plus and minus theta, x plus sine plus and minus theta y, where the choice of plus or minus depends on the outcome of the previous measure. So this adaptivity is absolutely essential. Um, without it, this you can sort of it's a nice and interesting thing to think about. But if you try and construct um, a computational model like this without this sort of adaptivity, um, you would find you would violate causality. So the outcomes of the measurements, the outcome of every measurement you make here is uniformly random. You can see this because the if you had the reduced state of any one of these qubits, it's uh, the maximum mixed state. So if we just look at the marginals for that qubit, it's, it's uniform. So every single measurement has a random outcome. And this choice of just the sign of the angle on, on the future measurements, this incorporates the correction to account for that randomness. This is very similar to in quantum teleportation, where you, you know, based on, on the outcome of Alice's measurements, Bob has to make a Pauli correction. It's the same, it's exactly the same mathematics. So they're very closely related. So 
I'd like to give a, give a, a simple example to, to show you how this works. And in fact, you can, you can derive the basic building blocks of this very simply. So, so, we can actually derive this from the circuit identity very similar to um, teleportation. And in fact, it's, it's a variant of a, a variant of teleportation called one bit teleportation, which was um, proposed by uh, Jung and, and, and colleagues back in. 2000, I think. And in this circuit, we have two qubits, one of them say psi, the other one prepared in state plus. And we apply a CZ between these two qubits. And then we measure in the X spaces. And in a few lines, you can work out what happens to this qubit. So we start off with alpha 0 plus theta 1 tensor plus. After the CZ gauge, we've got alpha 0 plus plus beta 1 minus. And then after the measurement, we have alpha plus plus minus 1 to the m beta minus, where m is a bit that's labelling the outcome of the measurement. So these two possibilities just differing by a phase here. And so you see the adaptivity in future measurement is going to be the thing which allows us to correct for this sort of extra uh, random phase flip. And, and these sort of random phase flips, one of these will occur with every measurement that we make. Okay, so we, we have to correct for those to make sure the computation does what we want. So this, we can think of this as first a phase flip on our qubit, and then a Hadamard gate. Okay, so it's a very simple way of building a Hadamard gate out of a CZ gate and an X measurement. But we can, we can generalize this, and we can actually construct more gates, in fact a whole continuous family of gates. So, we can add to this a UZ gate, so this is just a diagonal phase gate, okay. and this corresponds to a rotation of the block sphere around the, the Z axis through angle theta, and you see we could insert this phase gate at the beginning of the computation. Okay, so what, what, how will this change the computation? Well now, because we've just inserted this extra gate, we now have an extra gate. Okay, so this, this seems like cheating. I have added an extra rotation to my computation by adding an extra rotation to my computation. But it's not trivial because this Z gate is diagonal gate. The CZ gate is also diagonal in computational basis, therefore they commute. And so I can move it. And so I can bring it to the other side. And bring it to the other side of the CZ gate. And then I can <coughs> incorporate it into the measurement. And you can you can show that. Having this Z rotation followed by an X measurement is equivalent to measuring in a rotated basis cos theta X plus sine theta Y. So now I've got a way of way of, of, of constructing this funny little gate, which is a, a product of Hadamard and UZ theta, out of a CZ gate and a, re, and a rotated measurement. Now this 
funny looking gate is actually very powerful because this actually generates the whole of SU2. <coughs> um, so how can we do that? So you can see that Okay, going back to the analogy between SU2 unitaries and rotations of the block sphere, we can write the general unitary um, as a general single cubic unitary as an X rotation, that's a rotation on the X axis on the block sphere, followed by a Z rotation, followed by another X rotation. But these X rotations, they're equal to Z rotations surrounded by Hadamard. So you see what we get. <coughs> we get a sequence of these H, U, Z, H, U, Z, H, U, Z, H, U, Z. So we can build an arbitrary rotation out of this H, U, Z. A universal gate for single. So now <coughs> we want so we, so to construct our arbitrary single cubic gate, we need to concatenate these um, concatenate this construction. How do we do it? Well, in the obvious way we take the output of one and feed it into the input of the next. So so here's the first process. We've got our measurement there, I will write it in, then take next measurement, and so on, and so on. Okay. So, by combining these CZ gates, these measurements in this funny basis, we can concatenate this. And how does the um, adaptivity work? Well, simply enough that if we take the output of this measurement and use it to determine the sign of this measurement, <coughs> okay, then you find that this correction um, accounts sufficiently and basically reverses the effect of the unwanted Pauli operator and allows you to achieve the measurement that you, the, the, the unitary that you intended. So you have a sequence of these things with adaptive measurements all the way down. You end up with some arbitrary U on your initial state. And so now to convert this circuit picture of teleportations into a cluster state computation, it's very simple. Let me just assume that my input state is plus. And then, you see, this first part of the, the, the computation is preparation plus state and application CZ gates. So this is just made cluster state. And then we have single qubit measurements. <coughs> and so this is how measurement-based quantum computing works for single qubit computations. It translates into a 1D line, a one-dimensional linear cluster state, um, and this is sort of universal single qubit computations. And I won't go through the the details of how we extend that to two to, to universal computation in general, but I remind you that all we need to convert single Cubic gates to a universal set of, of, of quantum gates is to add an entangling gate like a C0 gate or like a CZ gate. And so you can probably believe me when I say that if we have a two dimensional cluster state now, the extra CZ gates in the other direction give you the ability to form now entangling CZ gates on your logical uh, coded cube. So this becomes equivalent to 
a circuit model computation with single cubic rotations and entangling CZ gates, which is universal. <coughs> Questions on measurement based on good. Um, Question? Yes. Sorry. Uh, so is the geometry and the topology of the of this grid important? So if instead of yes. if instead of squares with something else? It's important. So it 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 needs to be sufficiently two dimensional for universality. Quasi one dimensional graphs will not give you universality. So if you have a tree, you do not get universal quantum computing. But if you have, so most sort of two-dimensional, quasi-two-dimensional lattices will give you universality. And so this has been shown for all of the regular lattices, all of the regular lattices in 2D, but also for percolated lattices. So lattices that are created at random. So turns out to be very useful. So if I, if I create my edges maybe independently random, imagine I have a quantum gate which for reasons best known to itself only works with a certain probability and I try and build a state, I'll end up with some, some lattice like this. It turns out that if the probability of putting the bond in is above the percolation uh, threshold for this graph, then you will have, so in, when we're above the percolation threshold, we have a large um, connected super cluster, and this is um, sufficient for universal quantum computation. Below the percolation threshold, this breaks down into lots of small fragments, and it's not universal. There's not enough entanglement there. What about higher dimensional grids? Do you get extra power? They're already universal, but do you get something extra? Uh, you do, in a sense. So, um, one thing I haven't talked about here is fault tolerance. And so, to achieve fault tolerance, you need to add error correcting codes and error correction. And there is a way of extending this into three dimensions which incorporates within it, it's measurement-based quantum computing, but incorporates within it the error correction of the surface code. So this was hooked up by Robert Rausendorf and colleagues. And so this is just now a three-dimensional, we have a three-dimensional grid instead of a two-dimensional grid. The three-dimensional um, structure now has within it surface code, surface code error correction. So um, go, you can't do that in, in, in 2D. Question? What what if you have a non-local stabilizer, something like, not the perfect correlations, mm -hmm. but something like, I don't know, hypergraph or... So, you can generalize these um, graph states to hypergraphs. And the way you do it is quite <coughs> neat. So, CZ gate looks like this. Okay. I can also cook up a CZ gate, which as eight of these things. Okay, so, so we apply a Z conditional on two controls. Um, and you can then have a hypergraph where you have hyper edges and a hyper edge between three vertices would correspond to a control control Z gate and you know, higher order edges would give you C, 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 Z gate. Um, these are very interesting from their entanglement properties, but so far um, it's not been clear whether they're useful for measurement-based quantum computing. They might be. Uh, I mean, you can certainly put hyper edges in, and, and this gives you extra gates. But because we've already got a universal gate set, that doesn't really change things significantly. Yeah. Yes. So at the end of the first part of the talk, um, you stated that there can be a relationship. Yes. Um, how is that related with this? Good question. So that my final final whole part of this lecture is to that I'm going to talk about now is to tie those two things together. So how how is the first part of the lecture connected to the second part of the lecture? And the connection is in the adaptivity. So 
I said that these, these measurements are adaptive, meaning that we, we choose our uh, measurement basis here dependent on the outcomes of previous measurements. So this requires some classical computing. Okay? Classical computing needs to collect all the previous measurement outcomes and do some processing on it. Okay? So what does this classical computer have to do? Well, it turns out this sign here, this, this, this minus sign, let's call it minus 1 to the kappa, um, turns out that kappa always has the form of a parity of a set of measurement outcomes. So the adaptivity you do here requires an extra computational resource. It requires an extra, again, for the same reason that we needed to compute the parity of outcomes in the CHSH inequality. We need to do something to convert our disparate set of measurement outcomes into a single global value. Um, so we need this classical computer, but in this classic cluster state model of, of measurement-based quantum computing, this classical computer only needs to do linear computation. That's all you need. So, and the reason for that is very simple. It's because, I mean, basically, this adaptivity is the same as what you do in um, interpretation. You know that when you teleport, you get a random powering. So essentially, this is like a circuit model with loads of random Pauli operators being inserted everywhere. Okay? And basically, the way you do the correction is you, you want to feed these, these, these Pauli operators through the circuit to the end, where there's a simple way to correct for them. For example, if I have a Z measurement, and I have an X Pauli sitting immediately before it, I know that X Pauli is going to flip the outcome of this Z measurement. So I can correct for it by just flipping the outcome of the measurement. So if I flip the outcome of my Z measurement, it's effectively cancelled out the, the power loop there. So what we need to do um, to, to perform these calculations to work out how this cancellation will work is just keep track of accumulating power loop operators. And how do power loop operators accumulate? Well, you know, if we have x to the a times x to the b is equal to x to the a plus b. So keeping track of accumulating Pauli operators only requires linear computation. And so the, the, the big picture is if we have linear classical computation, in other words a classical computer that's built out of XOR gates alone, if we add the ability to have access to, to bell states, yeah. have bell states and the ability to measure those things, we get some, we now get a non-deterministic, non-linear computation. If we add GHZ states, well, we can now think of those GHZ states as a little resource for measurement-based quantum computing. The GHZ, in this perspective, the GHZ experiment is nothing other than a simple measurement-based quantum computing experiment. And in some sense, it's the simplest example of measurement-based quantum computing, because it's doing the simplest computation. It's computing the at here, or now, depending on which way you write it. And then, if you add the plus the state, you get Well, I, maybe you've not done this. Like that is wrong. Maybe that's not the right way to say it. I, I'm, yes, I get, I get, I, I, I won't, I won't, I won't commit myself to writing anything. Else. I will say that I get um, something which cannot be achieved by linear gates alone, but it's not a deterministic nonlinear. So, yeah, I guess it, you could think of it, it's a complex combination of nonlinear gates and linear gates. Okay, so I think that's, that's, I've covered everything that I wanted to cover today. So, I'll take some questions now.
Yes. Well, I, I should have asked earlier. Right? Yes. I didn't entirely follow the doing Hanamore with the simplest oh. version. Let me, tell, let me tell you what I did see. Yes. Um, so you make measurements, and these measurements were supposed to be <coughs> later. Uh, yes. I didn't see it in years later. Ah, so, ah, but it's still important. It's so, I guess it's, it's the end of there. So, what, what's going on here is that I have not performed, so, so where m is 0 or 1, okay? <coughs> so, if m equals 0, I've got the Hadamard here. If m equals 1, I've got the Hadamard times z. So, this is unavoidable. So, any, any computation in this measurement based picture is always actually a set of possible computations, each labeled with a measurement outcome and each equivalent up to a Pauli, uh, an extra Pauli operator. And how does it change mm -hmm. And so this is equal to x h. So the Hanamard is an example of a, of a, well, I'm getting the Clifford group. I'm going to talk about the Clifford group more tomorrow. But the Clifford group are the gates which transform um, Pauli's into Pauli's. So we see that H, Z, H is equal to X. And so there's actually only, I only need to consider two types of gates to construct a universal gate set. I have my Clifford gates, and they have this nice property that I have some Pauli operator C, sigma, sigma U is equal to sigma dash U. Sorry, see, u sigma dash. Meaning that I said that I want to sort of bring all my Pauli corrections to the end, where I can correct them in post-processing of measurements. So I, I draw them through the circuit. When I have a, a Clifford gate, and this includes things like Hadamard, CZ, C0, hey, some more, we'll see tomorrow. Then, when I change the order of the, the Pauli error and the gate, the gate stays unchanged, the Pauli error changes. So here, Z has been changed there. So I need to keep track of that as well. Uh, but this also all can be done in this linear framework. And the other type of gates I have are rotations. And if I have a rotation uz of theta, x uz theta is equal to uz minus theta. Okay? And so x uz theta equals uz minus theta x. So this explains why the adaptivity is just flipping the size of these measurements. Basically, each, each of these extra Pauli errors can reverse the sign of one of my rotations. And I therefore reverse the rotation itself to account for that. More questions? Perhaps. So, what about the terms of the connection between linear computation and parallel inequalities when you consider more settings and more errors? This is a good question. It gets more complicated. Um, so I'd suggest, if you want to know the details of this, talk to Matty, Matty Hogan, maybe here. Well, he's not here, but he'll be around this week. Oh, he's at the back. He's got a nice paper on this. But, so, well, my, my, my simple argument breaks down. Um, so, when we have bits, you know, the only, um, functions that map bits to bits are linear. Now that's not true if I go to say trits or dits or other, any other um, base, I can now get a non-linear function in a single. So for example, say I had 0, 1, 2, I have a function that swaps that to 0, 2, 1. Okay. Um, I think that's the I don't know what that function is, but that's, that's nonlinear. And so, the, yes, it gets, it gets more complicated. And, and this is, again, related to um, other things which I will talk about in the coming days, the, the difference between d equals 2 and higher dimensions. Um, we, can, we can often find we'll get different mathematical structures for, for q bits than for q dits for d greater than 2. My question is based on the quantum circuit model. So when we have a circuit model, we always have uh, error schemes yes. and we have uh, uh, optimization of the resources. Yes. So here, uh, what do I understand by the optimization of resources and what would that be? 
So the resource here is really the, the cluster state. And the thing to optimize would be the, the number of qubits. Um, so this would be equivalent to optimizing the number of gates in a circuit model. Yeah, but then now when you talk about uh, quantum gates, because since now your library is one C0 and any uh, arbitrary yes. uh, single qubit gate, yes. so you can always say I can squeeze this number of gates to yes. two gates. Yes. So how would that, so that's basically level compaction you're talking about. Yes. So what would you say about that? So you, you are limited in, so you, you, we have certain sort of atomic gates here, the, these H, H limitations, which cannot be further compacted. We have two of them together, they remain two, because the product of them is no longer one of those gates. So, so you're right, that, that changes. Now, as it turns out, I, I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow, in full-time quantum computing, we have a restricted gate set, and you don't assume you can achieve arbitrary local rotations, and in fact, you normally just take the Clifford gates and the single non-Clifford gate, the T gate, so the T gate looks like this. Okay, and the T gate, if, if you now construct your gates out of T gates and Clifford gates, then again you'll have the same issue. You, 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 really the relevant resource count is the number of T gates, the minimum number of T gates in your circuit. Okay. Many experts on that in this room actually. And there, this, the, 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 the mapping of resources between measurement based quantum computing and circuit model is much more similar because we, we, we hit up against the same roadblocks, the same limitations on combining on gates. So it basically depends upon the technology which gates we're using? Yes, it does. Though fault tolerant schemes tend to steer us towards this one, but not solely. This, there are other. Questions? So, well, let's thank Dan. <laughs>